Hey everybody, I'm Sean Powers, and today we are going to cover the next section in the Linux Plus certification objectives exam stuff, but I have a confession to make. In the last video, I lied to you. No, God! No, God, please, no! No! I said that there was going to be Patreon supporters scrolling by, and there were not. I'm so sorry to my Patreon supporters, but unless something horribly wrong happens, they should be scrolling now. And I thank you to all of you who are supporting me. Uh, you're very patient because I often forget things or say they're there and they're not. Uh, if you want to be a Patreon supporter of mine, this is not a great advertisement for such thing, but I will have a link in the description. But let's get down to the next section of the Linux Plus objectives. Now, specifically, we are going to cover this part right here. Now, I know I have the entire thing highlighted, uh, but I actually got overzealous in our last video and I covered how uh, TLS SSL stuff works and the whole thing. So if you want to see this again, look at the last video where we covered it, section 2.1.1. Uh, but we're going to focus on authentication. Uh, and I have to remind you, actually I have to remind myself that this is all about best practices and summarizing the purpose. We're not going to get in the nitty gritty of configuring any of these services. I just want you to understand what they are, why they exist, and what might be a good way to utilize them in your Linux system so that you can answer the questions in the test about it. And I say that, but I never ever want to teach just for the test. So this section is really important. And there's a lot of nuance around the services that we're going to talk about with authentication. And it's not just authentication, it's authentication and authorization. And let's just go through the various terms I talk about and I'll explain what they are, how they work together and why it matters, or I'll try to. Now, you've probably heard some of these terms before, like single sign-on, and this is where if you go like to a website or sometimes your computer, but usually it's going to be a website and it will query a third party site or service or server. And it's the kind of thing where you log into a computer, but instead of typing in a username and password, like maybe you click on like Google to authenticate yourself, and then you'll go to Google and Google will allow you to log in. And then Google sends back a token to the computer or the website that says, yep, that's he is who he says he is. And they let you in. They there's no actual local passwords uh, that are managed there. Auth authorization or actually authentication, I'm going to clarify that in a minute. Authentication is handled by the third party. And single sign-on just means that third party is the single sign-on. Now you could host theoretically the single sign-on. Like one server is the place where everybody authenticates from, like maybe it's Active Directory, and every computer, every website will authenticate from that one single uh, place. And the advantage there is many. One, you don't have to have like a bunch of usernames and passwords. And on a website, like a public facing website, it's nice if as the website host person, you don't have to worry about hosting usernames and passwords at all. Because if you don't host usernames and passwords, there's nothing that you can expose if you have a data breach. I mean, there's stuff you can expose, but you're not going to expose usernames and passwords if you don't have them. So there is a really big advantage. And this is specifically uh, talking about authentication. I am who I say I am. I'm S powers. I say I'm S powers. I'm authenticated. Yes, you are S powers. But that's not the only thing that matters when it comes to saying who I am. Again, we're going to talk about that in a minute. A lot of foreshadowing, Sean. Um, the other thing that you're probably familiar with, and maybe you don't know it by this term, but multi-factor authentication, or sometimes it's just a two FA, like we'll call it two-factor authentication, but it can be more than two. So the proper term is going to be multi-factor authentication. And it just means multiple um, authentication mechanisms are required before you are considered fully authenticated. So uh, usually what this looks like is you will enter your username and password. And as long as you get that right, you will also have to do something like open up your Authy app or your Google Authenticator. And you'll have to like every 30 seconds, a code is changed and it generates a new token. That's the one of the buzzwords we're going to talk about. It generates a token that is valid for 30 seconds. And you have to type in that token, that six digit code uh, within the 30 seconds. And if you do, then that is the second factor 
of authentication and says, okay, you're in. Uh, another example of a multi-factor authentication would be, are you a robot? And you know, you check it and you have to like find all the crosswalks or the motorcycles or whatever, or you have to like type in or like look at a really messed up letters and numbers and like try to figure out what they are. You know, all of those, those things are multiple factors of authentication. Now those, um, those are actually called CAPTCHAs and they are just, I don't know if it's officially a multi-factor authentication. Um, it's more like uh, prove that you are human. So sort of is, but for sure those codes that you get, like when you have to use Google Authenticator or Authy to get like the six digit token, uh, that's definitely a multi-factor auth. So multi-factor auth, two-factor auth, that's the same sort of a thing. And the big deal is that it requires multiple forms before it will consider you authenticated. Okay. And they can be software like those six digit or eight digit, whatever codes on the Authy app. Um, but they can also be hardware. So they make devices like a Yubi key, uh, which is a USB device, but it's not like a storage device. It's specifically an encrypted thing that is tied to your account. And so you can use that as a multi-factor authentication device. You have to physically plug this physical device into the computer along with entering your username and password. So there are multiple types of multi-factor authentication. The whole idea is though, that if you have more than one form, it is more likely that you're you, right? I mean, somebody could uh, get a compromised username and password, but if they would also have to have your phone with the Authy app or something in order to enter that second line of authentication. So it's just a, a way to keep things safe. You'll often see this actually all over now, but at first it was specifically for like banks and stuff. They're really big on multi-factor auth. Oh, banks made me think of like sometimes on a phone, it can be like face ID or touch ID or like fingerprint scanner. That's another form of authentication. But I digress. Now, this slide has too much information on it, so I had to make my face disappear, but I promise I'm still here. This is where this isn't really part of the objective, but I wanted to specify because it gets confusing. There's authentication, which is what we've been talking about, right? I am who I say I am. But then there's also authorization, and authorization seems similar. In fact, they start with off, uh, but it's slightly different. And then identity is also a little bit different. So authentication is like we've been talking about. I am who I say I am, uh, and here is my proof. Here are my credentials, right? My password, my fingerprint, my retinal scan, my uh, authy token generated by the app. Um, authorization is like, okay, I believe you. You are Sean Powers. However, you are not allowed here, right? There could be something where I can say I am who I am and prove it, but that doesn't mean that I have access to everything. So whether or not you're authorized is completely different from whether or not you're authenticated. Of course, this makes sense, right? I sh I'm not authorized to have access to somebody else's files usually. And so that information has to be stored some more as well. And then identity is, uh, this is less, uh, less specific to like permissions and stuff, but identity is something else that is stored about a user, specifically things like your full name, maybe your room number in the office, your phone number. Um, and my example here is, yeah, I'm not allowed, but check out my cool profile pic. Wouldn't you like somebody who looks like this in your office? No, because you've seen me. And the reason that's important is because when it comes to a Linux server, uh, managing authorization and authentication and identity, there are a lot of ways to skin a cat. That's a terrible metaphor. Oh my God. There's a lot of ways to do the same thing. And there are some not conflicting, but there's overlap in some services. Like, uh, we, we're going to talk about LDAP and, um, LDAP and, and PAM and SS. Let me just show you the next slide. This is another slide with lots of information. So I'm gonna make my face disappear. And let's talk about the various things that are on our system. So I'm gonna start in the middle here with PAM, which stands for Pluggable Authentication Modules. And this is a system that will allow us to use various methods to authenticate uh, the users on our system. It could be local files, right? It could be the, the password database, like the et cetera, P-A-S-S-W-D and the et cetera group file. Or it could be, um, it's not used much anymore, but like NIS was something I used to use a lot. It's a network username and password database that you can query. A lot of times now we will look at an LDAP 
database, which I'm going to talk about. Obviously, it's on the left for storing usernames and passwords in a central location, or it's not mentioned in the objectives, but Active Directory is one of the most popular ways to store authentication and authorization information. So there are a lot of ways that we can store things. And PAM was designed so that we can configure our system to connect to those various things and integrate with our system itself. Um, LDAP is specifically mentioned. So I wanted to talk about it, even though I didn't start there. And this just stands for lightweight directory access protocol. And this it actually started out like an address book kind of thing, and it's stored in sort of that way. However, LDAP really became a, a central player in how user information is stored. This It can store authentication, usernames and passwords. It can store authorization, who's allowed to do what. It also stores identity information, or it can store some, but not all, or all but some or whatever of these various things. So LDAP is a very flexible system that usually runs on a central server and then PAM can be configured to communicate with LDAP to get all that information. However, there's a new kid on the block and it's called SSSD. Uh, it stands for System Security Services Daemon. And this doesn't do a whole lot on its own. That, that's not fair. It does It does a lot. So this is uh, popularized by Red Hat. Red Hat started using this. It's in a lot of places now, but Red Hat has been relying on it for a very long time. And SSSD does a few things that PAM does as well. What it can do is kind of be like the puppet master. If you want your system to authenticate, SSSD can be the one-stop shop for saying, okay, we're going to use... LDAP for user authentication, uh, but we're going to use an Active Directory server for authorization information. And when it comes to identity, we're going to use local files. Um, I guess you could configure it that way. I've never done that that way, but um, SSSD is kind of like the Puppet Master. It pulls the strings and allows a system to be very flexible in how it connects to the various um, internal or external ways to authenticate. Uh, one really nice thing that it does, and I scribbled over it here, so there we go, um, is that it caches information. And that doesn't seem like a big deal. However, if you have your credentials, let's say your, your like username and password stored on LDAP, and your local system is trying to log your user in, but for some reason there's like a there's like a network split and all of a sudden you can't reach that LDAP server, well, you wouldn't be able to log in to your local computer that is running SSSD. And so one of its features is that it will cache credentials from whatever remote system it happens to be connected to. And so that's a really nice thing. So if something goes wrong, uh, you can log in with that cached information. It's important to know that SSSD can do caching. And again, it just kind of like pulls the strings and allows the various systems to uh, communicate. It allows your system to communicate to uh, various other systems to do authentication, authorization, uh, identity management, all that sort of stuff. So here's the deal. Linux is super flexible, sometimes frustratingly so, because there are a lot of ways that we can accomplish the same thing. But if you're in a system with Active Directory or LDAP or in a network with those things, Things, something like SSSD will help pull those strings so that they can all work together. But you can also just use PAM, which has been around longer, uh, and it will also directly interface with LDAP. Now, it doesn't have those same caching features, uh, but PAM is still in the mix. SSSD doesn't replace PAM. SSSD will communicate with PAM uh, in order to authenticate your local system. So they all kind of like get together and work together and understanding what the difference is with the things that they do and how they might work together is going to make you a better system administrator. So remember to learn everything, do what you love, and most importantly, be kind. Thanks for watching. I know this wasn't a hands-on video, but hopefully you learned some stuff and I will see you in the next video. Now, I know with great power comes great responsibility. That's why I have the Patreon supporters scrolling by again two times in this video because I, I know I messed up, but you know, I'm making up for it right now. See him scrolling on the screen? Look. Okay, is that better? All right, man. I don't know. It's the best I can do.